Uh, we have James Payer here today from Cambrian Bio, and he'll tell us a little bit about how to fund and build geo protectors. And I think uh, he can do that much better than I. So I will be in the chat. I'm going to share your um, bio and everything. And if anyone has any questions, just let me know. Um, okay. Bye bye. All right. Thanks, Allison. And um, yeah, so as just kind of like some frame setting, and then we'll get in. Um, my goal here is actually not to share a whole bunch of data about the programs that we're in. So as of right now, Cambrian has uh, 14 different programs active, uh, different drug development programs in the longevity space. But we've actually only revealed one of those so far, which was the company I mentioned that we took public um, back in February. And, and so I would love to show you the, the smorgasbord that we're working on, but that will have to be for a future talk. Um, and and I actually thought that there was a cool opportunity, especially with many of the other guests that we've had coming in and talking to this group, to talk a little bit more about the what I think are the two key pieces that um, are shaping a lot of our discussions today outside of the science. One about the private financing of these of, of GER protectors in the longevity biotech world, and then the other about what the barriers are to having this field really become a thing, so to say, like what's preventing us from starting clinical trials with uh, to slow aging today. Um, I know Jim Kirkland talked about this and had some thoughts and, and we heard a little bit from uh, Ron Kahansky, uh last week, right? And and I just wanted to offer a bit of a perspective as well as some economics work that I did uh, on this at the end of the talk. So the idea here is I don't have a ton of slides to share, but what I'm going to do is I can start sharing a little something, um, and I'm going to go flip on and off of this throughout as we go through. So you guys should be able to see my screen here. Yes. Okay. And so the two parts here that I want to talk about is a little bit on uh, part what I'm calling longevity biotech does disco. Uh, disco is the abbreviation that we use for the distributed drug discovery company, which is how we've organized Cambrian. I want to talk about, uh, we'll, we'll get to how, how we go into that. And then the second part is like the first GER protectors and how they're going to come about what we need to do to get there. Um, oh, let me on this. There we go. For those of you that don't know me, I recognize, I think, more than half the names and faces uh, that I'm seeing already. But for those of you guys that don't know me, uh, I, I will leave this up here for a second. So I'm James Pyre. Uh, I'm mostly known in the space because I started a, a company together with um, Ola Menching and Niels Rega called Apollo Ventures. Um, this is about five years ago. We made a few really interesting investments, built some companies in the longevity space. And then I parted ways with them uh, about two years ago to team up with a guy named Christian Angermeyer to start a company called Cambrian Biopharma. And um, Cambrian is a, you know, this disco structure that I mentioned, distributed drug discovery company. So we're a single biotech that acquires and develops uh, other biotechs underneath us. So we're not quite a company building studio. We're not quite a traditional pharma company. We're definitely not a VC, but we're some mixture of all of those three things. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is and why this model has become so appealing to investors, especially in the longevity space. My background is, uh, is as a scientist. So I did a PhD in stem cell biology at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Um, and, and I actually became a scientist because I was interested in the aging space. So I think it was my, I was still in high school uh, when I decided that this is what I was going to be doing. Um, and then my freshman year of high school, I ended up at a, uh, convincing my parents to buy me a ticket to Cambridge uh, so that I could go to SENS 2, I think it was, in 2005. Um, which was my first ever academic conference and then decided there was enough interesting stuff going there that I had to figure out how to contribute. And so fast forward 16 years uh, and here I am. And so, yeah, I think I saw Aubrey's face here. Uh, so so I'm one of the, the Aubrey kids, I guess, that got into this originally through hearing what he was doing and, uh, and then growing from there. So 
any case, um, for this first part, uh, so I guess before we before we jump to this next part, the way I want to structure this is for for this first part about longevity doing the disco. I have three sections here, and I'm going to turn off sharing my slides to talk about each one of them because there's you know it's mostly just a conversational piece. Um, but then at the end of each of these bullets, like how to think about longevity biotech, what is a disco, and why are so many longevity biotech discos, I'm going to pause and go over some of the points that. I've covered. And if you guys want to, I would propose that we have like a little discussion break at the end of each of these points, just to address any questions that come up and make their way into chat during the during this lecture part. Um, and yeah, and then we'll just kind of like take our way through these three things and then move on to that second part. My goal is to leave at least 20 minutes for unstructured discussion at the end. So not talk your ear off, but as anyone on my team knows, that usually means we're going over time because uh, I tend to go on and on. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing now and and get into these three first topics about, about longevity biotechs. So my first one here is about how to think about the industry generally. Um, and, and so I wanted to just kind of go through a couple of interesting points here. like. I get asked all the time, what does it mean to be in the longevity space, right? Like different people assign that hat to themselves, but it's not always consistent if you talk from person to person what it means to be a longevity focused company. And I've had people tell me, oh, well, Cambrian's not a longevity company because you're taking, like you're making investments in cancer companies and other things. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit, but the way that I define it is that longevity biotech are private companies, almost always for profit, that are taking new, usually patented therapeutics that target the damage of aging. And that sentence is key for me. The indication, like what the first clinical trial is in, doesn't matter to me. It's whether or not you're targeting the damage that builds up during aging that leads to the inclusion or non-inclusion. And for Cambrian, that comes with one extra, uh, one extra caveat, which is that every drug that we take forward must have the possibility to become a preventative. Meaning, irrespective of what it gets approved for first, it must be able to, at least in theory, be used in a healthy person to prevent them from getting sick instead of waiting for them to get sick and then trying to unwind that with a with a drug. So that's number one. Number two, how to think about this field for me is uh, I've, I've started talking about the table stakes for the field of longevity biotech around indication selection. So before 2015 or so, um, longevity biotech was kind of described as like the people who wanted to do trials in healthy old people to slow down aging. And I think that that's not the investable uh, the investable mode for this field. If you've got a molecule that can target the damage of aging, that the, the way the field is shaping up is that people are choosing whichever indication, whichever disease that gets the most rapid evidence for human safety and efficacy with that drug. And then once you've got human safety and efficacy, the presumption is that then you'll be able to pivot that to take your now safe and efficacious drug to run a trial in healthy people to prevent them from getting a disease. And I think that, so that, so I call that like table stakes for the field in thinking about longevity biotech. Um, and then next, uh, I just wanted to make a quick, quick note. Cambrian, as well as most of the other kind of uh, multi-asset groups, whether funds or otherwise, have organized themselves around the nine hallmarks of aging, right? This is something you guys have all heard up and down, which I, I just wanted to make a quick note that like the hallmarks are a useful guide, but they're really not a gospel in how we can or should think about the aging space. The, it's important to remember that the hallmarks of aging are kind of a together version of all of the different competing theories of aging that existed in the like in the late aughts to early teens that were like that empirical evidence had emerged that no one of those competing theories 
was sufficient to explain all of the data that we were starting to get about extension of mammalian lifespan. Therefore, elements of all of these things had to be true. And so we kind of like tried to line up, all right, well, it's this damage and this damage and this damage and this damage. And we haven't found a lot of other types of damage included. Um, although, you know, depending on who you ask, some things, uh, some things were probably left off that list of nine hallmarks. But as we approach this with Cambrian, the point I wanted to make is, is just like, it's a useful guideline, but we don't go through a lot of time and energy to say like, oh, well, which hallmark is this drug targeting? Which hallmark is that drug targeting? Uh, do we want to target all the hallmarks of aging at once? And is that how you cure aging? I think those are unhelpful ways to think about it. It's instead just like, is this a type of damage that accumulates as we age, which when prevented or or reversed can enhance the health of an, an organism or a tissue, and that makes it a longevity biotech. Um, and then, and then my last thing about how to think about this, about companies in this field, are that longevity biotech companies have to be structured to achieve value from both their first indication that I mentioned, the first treatment that you're going to do the clinical trials for, and their JERA protective pot potential the treatment of healthy elderly um, or, or healthy, any, healthy any aged people. Um, otherwise the longevity tag is just marketing, right? One thing that I've learned from this is that, like most biotechs are built to get bought essentially in their late clinical stages, right? They go do their preclinical phase one, phase two and get acquired by a big pharma company. And if that's the case, the chances that that big pharma company is gonna run the Jera Protector trial that you imagined when you started out on, on the journey of, of creating this, uh, whatever company it is, nearly zero. And so unless you're setting the company up to be sustainable enough to make decisions about which trials you run after the first approval for that drug, it's not really going to be able to make a giant impact on the Jera science space. So I believe. Um, so that was that piece. I'm actually going to pause there so I don't just lecture on and on since that's already a lot. And I'm going to reshare my screen with some of those points and uh, pause. I'm not looking at the chat yet for questions. But yeah, maybe there we are already there. a few questions. Um, okay. and so if there's more, then please just put them in the chat or raise your hand so I know that uh, you, you'd like to go next. But we first have Alex, and maybe Alex, just one sentence about you as uh, so people who don't know you who uh, have some context. Uh, sure. Uh, I wasn't prepared to uh, go on video. Uh, but uh, yeah, Alex Javankov, uh, I run a company called Insulico Medicine uh, and also Deep Longevity. Um, I'm just wondering what uh, uh, drug discovery challenges do you see currently in uh, in your company and uh, how do you operate? Uh, is it a hold co with multiple SPVs uh, or uh, is it um, uh, kind of full-fledged biotech going after all those areas at the same time? And what are the drug discovery challenges like uh, target discovery, um, small molecule chemistry, uh, or it's uh, preclinical validation, target validation? Yep. Um, yeah, it would be so, interesting to understand how, how you see it and how you're addressing those challenges. Yeah, so, so as far as how we're organized, I'm going to punt that one to the next section because um, we're going to talk more about, about this DISCO model. And, uh, and then for the major challenges that I see to this space right now, uh, I actually don't see target ID um, really as the problem today. Most of the assets that we're bringing in are uh, at like lead, kind of, kind of hit to lead, lead to candidate stages is I think the sweet spot for where the really close to clinic impactful stuff in the longevity space is coming up at the, at the fat end. Well, there are some opportunistic things at the IND enabling stage and early clinical stages that we are keeping an eye out for. And, and so that, that's where we spend a lot of our time building the R&D execution teams to do the right chemistry, preclinical validation, and then bring as many INDs to, uh, to the fore as possible. So the way that I think about Cambrian as a company, we'll talk about this in a second, is that we're an engine for taking 
longevity science and then getting INDs out of that longevity science. And so we're starting our first few IND enabling studies this year with the goal of getting about, you know, between four and six new INDs every year for dramatically different programs uh, going forward. Well, can I extend the question then, uh, since you narrowed it down to basically IND, uh, ind enabling um, uh, kind of progression, uh, are you also in parallel going to do um, animal experiments? Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, like uh, aging animal, animal experiments. Ex yeah. So yeah. worms, flies, um, actually something that is not mice. Yeah. Um, so, so we actually have collaborations already set up to do worm longevity experiments with many of our drugs as just kind of like a quick and easy validation for whether something is affecting organismal longevity the way that we might think it is. And then, um, and then as we move towards candidate selection, I actually see mouse longevity studies as a common thing that we're going to be doing in parallel with starting clinical trials with, with every program that we push forward. That way we can be more and more ready to understand the value of, you know, getting closer to that first approval or a phase one, phase two safety efficacy study, and then being able to pivot into this GER protector space as soon as humanly possible without needing to do additional preclinical validation work. Thank well, you. That's we do have, so in the chat, I have four more questions popping up, right. so, so, but you want, actually wanted to ask the group a few questions, didn't you? Or at least get no, some I, I, I think my goal was just to like open up at stuff around this specific, like around each specific bullet point. And so we can't spend too much time here, but I think that Victor's question about orphan diseases, I think is perfect for this. So uh, Victor, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just read that one out. Um, Victor was asking how useful are orphan diseases to mimic certain aspects of aging and target from a financial perspective, for example, battens or, or progerias. Um, I have two very different answers for you on that question. So this topic of indication selection is I think the thing that Cambrian and before when I was at Apollo that we did best. In many ways, Cambrian's success is around choosing the right indications to start moving forward into the clinic. Um, and for orphan diseases that are directly related to the mechanism that you're targeting with whatever longevity drug it is. I think the, the favorite example of mine is uh, from one of the companies we did at Apollo called Aovian, um, where it was a rapamycin analog. And, and we found an mTORopathy, a, a disease in which mTOR was specifically overactivated and positioned the drug to first go into that orphan disease. And that was exactly like the right thing to do to get safety and efficacy data in as fast and as de-risked a way as possible. Um, and how, however, progerias almost never fit that, fit that definition. The, my view is that the damage from progerias uh, doesn't perfectly mimic natural aging. And to do a, an age slowing trial in progerias is first of all, a very uphill battle and and secondly, still requires very long-term trials that aren't ideal for plotting a, a critical path to safety and efficacy. So I have been less enthusiastic uh, about treating, you know, Hutchinson, Guilford, uh, or other progerias as like a general way of testing GERA protectors. I've seen some folks that I are, I think, more promising there are the ones who are really understanding, you know, what's going wrong with, for example, lamin, which is one of the proteins commonly mutated in progerias and like trying to repair the laminopathies, right? Target the specific mechanisms. I think that's more interesting to me than a generic GER protector. So it's mechanism, not indication focused. Um, and then one other question I'll take from Carl and then I'll, I'll get back from, I'll get back to the, the, the rest of the presentation. Hopefully this is, yeah, what we wanted to be doing. So that's how do you plan on uh, to prevent acquiring companies, the acquiring companies from ignoring the broader than initial indication potential. Um, for us, like this is a nice segue into the next question. For us, it's really easy because we're the majority owners in 
about every asset that we push forward. So as long as Cambrian is still aligned with the mission and the value of doing this, our pipeline of companies can be moved and pushed in that direction. And in fact, we usually, not in all cases, but usually don't have separate CEOs for those companies. It's one single R&D team pushing together all of these assets that are held in different companies underneath. And so that leads me kind of to my next so James, does that mean you're going to shy away from selling assets exclusively That's correct. entirely? Okay. Yeah, so not not entirely, um, but but I think that this was the the last point for me. Uh, I just stopped sharing my screen, but you you guys saw that uh, the goal was like achieving both the longevity and the non longevity value, and so for me, like Cameron is a company that's designed to be a new Genentech or a new you know, Novartis, not to be a biotech that comes up and then sells its drugs to the Genentech or the Novartis. And, and, and we may be able to do part like long-term partnerships where we still keep control of the second and third indications. But I think that the way that we capture this space is by building something really, really big and really long lasting. Um, okay. So, Second, second part of our three parts on, on this first one. So what is a disco and why do I keep talking about it? Um, Alex already alluded to this a little bit where, so, so a disco is a distributed drug discovery company. It's usually a C corporation. So it's like structured like a biotech, a single company, not a fund with many different shots on goal. And in particular, they take majority, but not usually 100% stakes in a group of subsidiaries, right? And so when I say Cambrian has 14 different assets in development, what I mean is that we have 14 different subsidiary companies. 11 of those right now are majority held by Cambrian between 50 and like 95%. And uh, and three of those are minority holdings. We, so we call them investments and our pipeline. Um, and and so the the other characteristic of this, with when you have many shots on goal, is that there are some centralized functions, particularly around the ventures functions, basically acquiring assets into the company launching new programs or starting starting the companies and the subsidiary companies and building them infrastructure functions like taxes financing legal ip all of that doesn't need to be replicated 15 times over you can have a single group of people who are very very good at doing that um, a big one is fundraising instead of having to have different people running around to investors raising funds for 15 different programs, we can just raise funds in one place and distribute them around as needed to the problems to the uh, pipeline companies that are most successful. Uh, and then also centralize the medicinal chemistry function, IND enabling studies, and the general management of, of the research and development process. And then the two big functions that are distributed are and I'm speaking kind of broadly here, are the biology, right? Particularly what our scientific founders who we start the companies with or spin things out with are bringing to the table. They have this deep knowledge in particular biological assays that, um, that stays at the company and builds out there, as well as when the company moves forward and gets into the clinic, that first indication is gonna be really specific to that, um, to that pipeline company, right? That that single asset, and so we build the clinical teams around uh, around e on each asset as well. So if you think about it, there's some functions in the hub, and there's some functions in the spoke of these discos. So next couple points, and then we'll pause again um, because I see a lot of confusion around this. Is how are discos different than VC funds, uh, especially as someone who ran a VC fund, and I'm now running a disco. This is a question I've asked myself many, many times to be totally clear on it. The first one of them is around time horizons. So VCs raise money from investors, and then they have to return that money in usually between seven and 10 years, right? And so you're supposed to make 
you know, X multiple of that money in that seven to 10 year time frame. Um, discos have no time frame on, on their investment realizations. Instead, the whole disco itself is a company that goes public. And so it can live in this sort of enduring way where it makes investments that it's looking to capitalize on over the next 20 or 30 years, as long as the value, the underlying raw value of that asset remains worth staying in, uh, staying in it. Secondly, I already mentioned, um, discos take usually bigger stakes than VCs do. They need more than 50% uh, of equity in assets that they partner with. Um, this is in part because of a, a US securities regulation called the Investment Act of 1940 that prevents someone from listing a VC fund on a public exchange, right? Many of you guys know that you need to be an accredited investor in order to put money into a private company, especially large amounts of money. And, and you can't get around the system by having a, a publicly listed company that just holds a bunch of, of individual assets, uh, minority stakes and individual assets like investments underneath it. Because that would be a way of getting around the securities regulations around accredited, accredited investors. And so for that reason, um, if you own more than 50%, then that, that accredited investor uh, closed loophole doesn't apply to discos. Third, um, the assets in on a program by program basis usually don't raise money on their own. Like if you're in a VC, you do a seed round and then you go find people to do a series A round and then you go find more people to do a series B round and you form these syndicates around each stage of the company. With discos, we don't usually do that. We just say, all right, we wanna do a phase two. How many millions is that? And we just say, kind of do a yes or no on pulling the trigger. Um, and then the last point on this discos versus VC funds is that even funds are moving towards this model now. And so if you look at some of the big biotech funds like um, Flagship or Third Rock that started this kind of company building VC bonanza, um, what I've seen is that because of some of the advantages of this model, its ability to go onto the public markets, its ability to last, centralize all these assets and reduce the risk of any single program failing. Um, <clears throat> these biotech VCs are doing bigger and bigger and bigger financing rounds into companies that are taking on more and more and more projects. And so even though they don't necessarily identify as such, this model is really being, um, I think quietly adopted by some of the the biggest funds in the in the space who are almost uh, painting the blueprint for how their model is a bit outdated in some ways, in my mind. And then the last topic is discos versus normal biotechs or normal pharma companies. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the two big differences here between us and a, a standard biotech. The um, I guess maybe three, because the first one is obvious, which is we have a lot more programs than a standard biotech. We don't think of ourselves as a platform. We think of ourselves like an engine, um, which is subtly different, right? A platform is, I, I think of that as like a single, um, a single technological uh, set of innovations that spawns lots of different lots of different drug development programs, but an engine is something that can take in substrate, take in ideas in this case, and then create new companies, create new new programs out of them. So, so we're an engine, um, not a platform, not a single asset company. And one of the things that differentiates us from another model of, of normal biotech, right? Which could just be a, a big company with a lot of programs, but, fully owns all those programs is we can do something interesting with our scientific founders. That there's two problems that come up when you have an, a scientist who makes an amazing discovery, but then you say, hey, I want to fold you in to this bigger company. Um, and so I call that the equity split prog problem in multi-asset companies. So like, let's pretend that Allison and I are both amazing scientists and the VC wants to get both of our inventions into a new company. In order to do that, if we're all gonna become the same company, we've made different inventions, 
the VC needs to convince Allison that her company, like that her invention and my invention, like we both have to agree on the same value of each other's inventions there. Right. But almost always what I see happen is that Allison thinks that her invention is the one that has more value. And I think that my invention is the one that has more value and the VC can't decide or can't bridge the gap there. And so they can't say like, okay, well, Allison, you get 1%, James, you get 1%, and then we like build the company. But Allison might say, no, I should get 5%. And I should say, no, I should get 5%. And Allison should get half a percent because my thing's the one that's going to be successful. Um, and, and that equity split problem has caused a lot of people endless headaches in starting these bigger companies. Um, but what we can do with the DISCO model is start a single company that has just one group of scientists focused on it around one asset and say, look, if this thing moves forward and if this becomes really successful, we're going to give you scientific founders than if you were you know, just taking this forward in a, a normal VC path, right? They end up with a bigger stake at the end of the day going with Cambrian than with anyone else. And, and they don't have to uh, try to value all of the other contributions into the bigger whole along that process. So that's the equity split problem. And then, and then the second problem that I think the discos get around really nicely is what I call the relay race problem in drug development, which is like, if you're a, a scientist or if I'm a scientist starting up a company, I've made some fundamental discovery, but drug development is a team sport, right? Where you have to pass it off from that original discovery to optimizing the drug to get it ready for clinical trials, to your IND enabling studies, to your phase one and your phase two. And, and the advantage of Cambrian is that we have all of those functions already built into the system. And, and so we can keep the scientific founders much more engaged and kind of along for the ride, as opposed to needing to have these, in my view, what often becomes really ugly conversations um, of like, all right, well, you were the scientist to this stage and now we need a new CEO or we need a new head of this company to like take it to the next stage and raise funding for this next piece. And then we're gonna need a different person or a different team to take it to this next this next piece. I think a lot of biotechs get stuck along that transition and we can kind of map all of that out for them with a much more, uh, a much more clear role of, of how we work with scientists to move something all the way into the clinic and beyond. So, I'm going to pause there on like the what is a disco. Um, or I'm going to go to stop there and then actually jump to the final point, which I think is a little bit quicker. Uh, and then I'm going to pause again for any questions and we'll continue this. So hopefully we're not rambling on too much. And so the last point was why are so many longevity biotechs structured as discos, right? And so I've already told you about Cambrian. You guys also know about Juvenescence. Life Bioscience started as a disco. There's like a series of other groups that are coming up that are trying to take these multi shots on goal approaches. And, and I would even argue that the majority of venture funding into this space is coming into structures like this. And I have four thoughts on why that is. The first one is that most of the investors coming into this space are in, like for, for those of us here in this meeting that think of ourselves as like working in the longevity space, most investors are investing in longevity, not in asset X, right? They're not trying to make the call that like, oh, well, this technology is going to be the game changer in senescence. They are instead investing with a thesis that's a little bit more general, something that like, oh, well, this group of researchers, this field of science is going to change medicine in profound ways over the next 10 or 20 years by allowing us to be proactive in preventing diseases before they appear as opposed to waiting to get sick. I think that that much more general thesis is what people are investing in. And therefore, if there are companies that can capture that whole thesis, as opposed to a tiny narrow part of it that has a lot more risk around you know, a specific asset, I think that's what's been much more successful as I've, as I've watched the space. Uh, that feeds right into my next point, which is around 
the the risk of catastrophic failure in drug and de drug development biotechs is a lot lower with a disco right if you have 15 20 30 different programs in development and you have the resources to fund those things then the chance that none of them are successful becomes a vanishingly small amount probabilistically un unless there are core issues at play in like the execution of your programs um, number three that I think is also really interesting is we're living in a world where preclinical and early clinical stage assets are going onto public markets faster and faster and are gaining more and more value. Um, but people have a hard time doing those preclinical assets. And so by mashing a bunch of them together, into a disco, there's a huge advantage of saying like, okay, well, we may not be able to uh, assign risk percentages for risk probabilities of success perfectly for every one of these compounds, but there is this high enough level of risk distribution, which we, we can model out, but I, I didn't want to talk about today, um, where it's like, once you have about 15 different programs in late preclinical, the chances that you get at least one drug approved is higher than 98%, right? And so if you're living in that world, you can actually achieve a value that's more, that's capturing more of the real value of the risk adjusted NPVs. So these are net present values, how we value drugs of preclinical assets earlier because there's less of this digital risk of like, oh, well, this is just a preclinical compound. It could succeed, it could fail, it's gonna be seven years out. Like, don't feed me any of these numbers. It's a much more emotional thing. But when you have 15, that's not the case. And then the, and then the last point that I wanted to make is that um, uh, something I've heard from many investors is that complete company building teams are really scarce in the longevity field. And what I mean by a complete company building team is that you have a group that has differentiated science, the wherewithal and the experience to select the right indication, get your IND enabling studies in a row, take that to, to clinical trials, successfully execute a clinical trial and raise all the money you need for it along the way, right? This is the venture capitalists common, most common, uh, refrain that I hear from them is like, there are, there's a lot of money, but there just aren't enough teams. Um, and in some ways, the disco model is kind of a solution to some of that. I, I describe it to people as like, we took the different elements that you would need to get a drug successful and broke them all up into different parts and built specific focus areas around each of those, uh, each of those topics. So I recognize them rambling on again. So I'm going to stop and see if there are any any questions here. I'm going to share my screen again uh, over these last couple of points. And then we'll uh, move into the last part and have some time for discussion. All right. I don't want to take the mic away from anyone. Any questions, comments here? Feel free to raise hand or just chime in. Carl, I saw you getting closer. <laughs> okay. And there's no pressure here. Uh, so do you, do you see that I mean, this is a great advertising pitch for discos, right? Um, it's, it's almost like you're selling discos as your lemonade stand product. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you think that we're gonna get just an explosion of the number of these things, um, both in the longevity and out of the longevity space? And do you think that what's going to, do you think that the discos are all just going to grow up and be new Novartises? Or do you think that some of them are going to get acquired by, you know, mega pharma? So my intention here was not to sell the model. It was to, to try to explain why I think the model has already been sold uh, and is being bought so well, um, just kind of quietly without people noticing it. And, and I kind of do think that this disco model is going to replace the single asset structure, but platform companies will still exist. And so most, I think most biotechs that will make it to the public markets over the next five years are gonna be structured either as discos or as big platforms. Because um, the, the disco doesn't, it doesn't replace the platform model. And, and so I guess that's, that's kind of the first answer to the question. Um, as far as like each of these needing to become the next Novartis, 
No, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of them that are not in the longevity space will make their bacon by uh, maturing a program through phase two clinical trials and doing m a to partner that program with a you know with a big pharma company and then reinvest that into into their early stage r d capabilities that would be the default way that we would run with cambrian and we still may do that from time to time i just think it's if if you have a space where the value really comes in the 15 to 20 year time frame as opposed to the five to ten year time frame then uh, you want to just be involved a lot longer and so following up on your <clears throat> platform versus single asset are most of your programs single asset or are you are your you know babies uh, some some platforms in their own right so so we have a couple of programs that are more platformy but i would describe most of our programs as as single assets and like let's let's be clear what i mean when i say single asset because if you go around, if you look at pitch decks of companies, every single company is a platform. Um, and so when I say single asset, I mean, they've discovered one novel area of biology. Say we want to exploit, I don't know, this aspect of mitochondria. And there are three proteins in this area of mitochondria that we think we have shown you can modulate to, to stimulate this really interesting effect. And we've made drugs that hit all three of that those areas uh, of that mitochondrial pathway, I would call that a single asset company. It, it's targeting, it's making a single set of scientific hypotheses. And if that scientific hypothesis is not correct, the whole company will fall apart. And, but you always try to take multiple shots on goal to maximize the chance that you can advance one or more candidate molecule to the clinic to explore that hypothesis. But I think that that type of company fits better in a disco, whereas a platform company is something more like, hey, we created this, you know, this AI platform to target any type of new gene, or we created a new way of making antibodies with higher affinity really, really fast, and we can make any kind of antibody targeting any kind of, any kind of target. Those platforms are what I mean when I say like capital P platforms. That are, that are different and don't fit as well in the disco. We have three quick questions in the chat um, from JJ, then Ashish, and then uh, Jose Luis Ricon. You go. Sure. JJ, uh, do you want to ask you a question? Yeah, sure. I, I just curious, like, um, like future career things currently are, I actually work for a venture capital firm and I'm kind of like thinking of like, what's like the next kind of thing. So this is actually interesting because I never heard of this model so so clearly before. So it was a really interesting conversation. I'm curious, like, is this like a, a way for an individual kind of contributor? Could they join a disco and you need like a big team or how does that work? So, um. If you're asking if we're hiring, the answer is yes, always and constantly. Uh, the the bullet that I didn't mention that's about these discos is like they end up being really big companies, and so um, let me try to address your question question directly here. So, like as an individual coming in and contributing, it's not that different from coming into any given biotech company as part of a team, right? And the 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 difference is where different people contribute. So like at Cambrian, we have four different teams that are running at, a, at any given time. We have our ventures team, which is which operates like an in-house VC, constantly looking for deals, kind of like for, you know finding scientists, forming new companies, this kind of stuff. We have our R&D team, which is responsible for taking these projects and advancing them from you know, hit to lead to candidate. Etc. cetera, um, and into the clinic. And then we have our operations team, which is responsible for everything else that it takes to build a biotech company. And then the fourth teams, or the fourth team is kind of this, uh, the, the spokes of the hub and spoke model, each individual group that is moving their asset, their discovery forward to its next stages. And so there's an opportunity for folks to get involved with any of those pieces. Um, and, and so Cambrian has grown, I think we started it two years ago. We have 105 people on payroll right now. So it's, it's quite a big group, um, all, all told. Okay, next one up, we have uh, Ashish and then Jose. 
Yeah. Hi, James. Very nice talk. My question is, how do you distribute value or recognition among the scientific founders if an individual drug program is a success or failure among in this DISCO model? So there's two parts of that that I'll try to address really quickly. Um, the first part is that individual success sits with the scientists much longer in the DISCO model than in the standard biotech model that can pivot around all over the place or just become absorbed into an R&D company. Because let's say that we have an asset that makes it through phase three trials and gets approved. That asset, it still has substantial direct holdings. And in fact, the, you know, in many cases, the only non-Cambrian equity holders are the scientific founders and like some of the clinical team. And if that's the case, then those scientists receive not only direct financial recognition, but are, they are still like attached to that company as the inventors and uh, and you know contributors to that asset that went forward. So there's not the same kind of like splitting problem that that folks have um, in a, in another multi asset setting. The second part of the question or like the second aspect of that question of like, how do, in my view is like, how do we get people to still work together well? Um, and that's a trickier one, right? And, you like, dis and like splitting the recognition around saying like, we're all part of a team together that are trying to advance this space. And to me, that really is much more about the culture of an organization that you build. And when you're creating a disco, I think one of the most um, most critical things for me is around celebrating successful failures, recognizing that this whole game is about un forming hypotheses that we don't know the answers to. We don't know how the science is going to work out, but it's worth testing. And if it's worth testing, then we do it. And whatever the science says is what the situation is. But no matter what, we were all on board with this hypothesis being worth testing. And when the data doesn't go the way that we had hoped it would, we say, well, it's really great that we looked into that because now we know that's not the case. And if you build that into the culture of an organization, I think it can be scientifically very healthy. Mm -hmm. Thanks for um, We just had another question. We had Aubrey's question bumped up and then Jose and then Vadim had another one here. <laughs> so, so I see Aubrey's example of a disco in another sector than longevity that was formed longer ago, five, 10 years. And has grown and prosper. I think, I think that uh, someone brought up Bridge Bio further down. Uh, Carl, you you brought up Bridge. I think Bridge Bio is my favorite example of the mature mature version of this model. Um, and and you know when I talked to investors for Cambrian, the way I framed us is like we're a Bridge Bio like company, but for longevity. There's a lot of parallels there. Um, as you look back to the evolution of this model, a lot of it has been business model evolution that started before 2015. So if you go back 10 years, you have um, companies like Nimbus Therapeutics that are being formed that had this kind of like hub and spokey structure, but a lot of it kind of evolved around uh, from IP holding companies, which was a very old way of doing this. Uh, and then that IP holding company little by little evolved into this more hub and spoke model when it merged with uh, Third Rock and Flagship, which are the other two pieces that I, I think are important to understand here. So Third Rock and Flagship are VC funds that have been some of the most consistently successfully performing funds in, uh, in the biopharma world. And what they majorly do is they incubate companies in-house and then deploy huge amounts of capital. They usually like take the entire seed and almost all of the series A rounds, put 50 million into these companies before letting other people in and, and then uh, kind of let them fly from there. And there are, are just so many inefficiencies that people have found around this model of like needing to build each of these companies on their own. Uh, the complaint that I've heard many times is that it just ends up so expensive to build up and replicate all of these functions over and over and over again. And the economics of a VC fund aren't actually that good for starting many companies, uh, many companies in a row, that it was like a natural transition where people looked at the third ship 
uh, Third Rock and flagship models and said, oh, well, wouldn't this work better if this was just a single company that did this as opposed to a series of VC funds all trying to do this company building thing? And I agree with that. But but it's a, that's a new... It's a new state of affairs as of about five years ago. Jose and Vadim. Um, yeah, so it's it's hard to see bio, biotech's working on <clears throat> um, very different moralities, um, pathways, or targets at once. That is in a in a combinatorial or combined intervention setting. And I was wondering if uh, um, part of it because it will be very complex as for a single company to work on on many things at once. Uh, but also because uh, at the FDA level, <clears throat> it will be difficult to get or more difficult to get those approved uh, if there are combinations. So I was wondering if you have thought about this at, Cam at Cambrian, about the possibility of trying, uh, of leveraging the structure of Cambrian to be able to try combinations of, inter of interventions for a single indication. Thanks. Yeah. So, so I think that you hit a nail on the head here. Like one of the things that I think is going to be critical to this space in the 15 to 20 year time frame is nailing combinations. There's not going to be a single longevity bullet. I see. Greg Fay on the call, who could, who is probably think has thought a lot about combinations in the longevity space, um, and and uh, like, but but in general, as we get multiple drugs approved as single agents, safety, efficacy, in one indication, then the next bridge is biomarker enabled single agent clinical trials in multimorbidity risk prevention, otherwise known as a slowing aging trial. But then the effects that we'll see from any single agent is going to be hopefully significant, but not that huge, right? We, we would predict five years healthy lifespan extension would be a massive boost already. But what does that do? It moves you from 80 to 85. Um, and so in order to get really, really large effect sizes, we're going to have to start thinking about combinations as early as possible. And so I mentioned to Alex before that like we're going to be running um, longevity trials with all of our drugs. One of the other things that as Cambrian reaches a scale that we can do is making that 10 to 15 year horizon investment and in starting to run combinational, combinatorial studies in animal models to figure out which uh, single agent GERA protectors work synergistically with, with each other. The ITP that the NIH is running has already started doing some very preliminary work around this. So like RAPA and metformin actually work better together than either of them individually, for example. Um, and I think that as we get to the point where we're using patented, more powerful single agent GERA protectors, I'm hoping that we'll see these syn synergies really accentuated even more. Um, yeah, and let's do Vadim, and then I'll I'll uh, jump from there. Yeah, thank you. So, um, why do I mean you described that um, your components, your companies uh, in your disco, uh, uh, the one requirement is is the use of hallmarks. I just wonder why do you think this is an essential component? Because to me, um, uh, hallmarks they they represent particular aspects of aging. Maybe one damage form or a few damage forms. Whereas the aging is the multiple damage forms. Would it be better to use the biological age? Uh, instead, instead of just any particular hallmarks, which uh, you know, you, you may imagine a situation when uh, a, a compound works by targeting the aging process without affecting any of the hallmarks. Yeah, and and so the the point I made earlier around the hallmarks, or was trying to make earlier around the hallmarks, is almost exactly what you're you're trying to say there. That the hallmarks are a useful guideline to say, hey, if you're impacting telomere lengths, or if you're impacting, you know, cellular senescence or stem cell exhaustion, or one of these things, then you're probably working on something that could potentially be a drug that could be categorized as longevity biotech. And so within, within Cambrian, we use that, that hallmarks of aging concept as a guideline to, to kind of quickly say, oh, well, are we addressing the damage of aging? Uh, are we addressing you know, some something, are we taking something forward that could potentially be used as a preventative? But I would say to your point, Vadim, like if we had a drug in hand and there was evidence, hey, this can slow down or cha change the direction of an epigenetic clock, would that make us consider it? I think absolutely, yes. Um, the Yeah, we, we don't have time to get into the secondary questions of like validating those things in the human clinical setting. But I think that's where our a lot of the work that uh, that you've been work you've been working on, as well as like other folks in the space, I think that's where we're going to see some huge effects. Um, 
in that longer time frame as we start doing the human trials for this. Um, so, Allison, can we go from here? I recognize, as predicted, uh, we're nearing the end of our hour. Well, I um, have time. I'm not sure how, how constrained you are. OK, I can stay a little over. Let me actually, am I sharing my screen? No, I'm just going to message someone to move uh, my meeting after this. Um, and then we can talk a little bit more, because I'm not going to go in deep into the whole second part that I had prepared. Uh, but there is one or two slides that I wanted to show, um, if that's all right. That's so, fine. I have time. <laughs> OK. So I guess a bit of introduction into this. Um, we And actually, Vadim's question kind of like teased this up really nicely. I, I like to think of this space. I'm going to share a slide here for a second. I like to think of this space as operating along two simultaneous swim lanes that are going over the next decade. And so here's my here's my little slide of this. But I feel like the last decade has been about discovering ways of extending healthy life in mice. And as a field, we've done this pretty successfully. Uh, and then Right now, this decade, there's one group of people that I'm going to call longevity biotech that are showing safety and efficacy of these different medicines in human clinical trials. And then I think there's this second pathway or the second thing that's going on to develop a clinical pathway for age slowing medicines. Um, and I've been a huge advocate of starting trials like the TAME trial and any TAME like trial that is doing two things at once, right? Trying to measure whether an intervention can slow the onset of age-related diseases in a human population, and two, simultaneously correlate that interventional trial to a biomarker, uh, or really a, a composite biomarker of multimorbidity risk that the FDA could later use to justify an accelerated approval for um, of other trials in, in otherwise healthy individuals. And only when those two things really come together, right? We've got a bunch of safe and effective medicines that are entering the market with potentially geroprotective properties. And we have this clinical pathway that's validated by a series of well, like well-controlled interventional studies. Do we end up when we're, I think we'll be in the 2030s, the, the scenario three, where we can start approving age slowing therapeutics to be used in healthy people to prevent disease. Like that's when those trials can really, really kick off. Um, and I just wanted to show a couple slides. Uh, so a few years ago, I did a project with um, Celine Halua, who many of you guys might know is she's the CEO of a company called Loyal that's working on dog longevity. She was a, a PhD student at Oxford. And uh, we conceived and wrote a paper together that we never published, but I think asked a kind of interesting question. Um, and the question was, what is the value in terms of like risk discounted net present values to society of a JARA protector of different efficacies? And so we took as like an example, what if metformin turns out to be a a decent uh, a GR protector, but a really weak GR protector, right? And only extends human lifespan by one year. What is that worth? And I just wanted to like walk you guys through some interesting, uh, some interesting conclusions from this, and then we can pause and, and do some more Q and A, and, and then break up from there. Um, so if we had a ten cent pill, which is about what metformin costs, about seventy bucks a year, that granted one extra year of life. Um, you would generate about, just in the US, about 50 million um, qu increased quality adjusted life years by treating people over 55 in the 40 years following that approval, uh, which I kind of flippantly say here, you know, that's like eight, 800,000 children cured of cancer or 300,000 prevented terrorist attacks. Um, but, but that's kind of flippant. The, the more interesting thing to me is the, um, the aggregate net present value for this, which 
takes a really long time to start showing response, uh, start showing a value, but is huge in the end, right? So it's if you are willing to wait 50 years after you start trials, a drug that is that extends life by just one year is worth a trillion dollars over those over those 50 years. Not small. And that includes like interest rates and like discounting the future back uh, along the same kind of investment strata that a government would want to invest in. So what this means is that even, I don't know if you can see my mouse, even if you take this little nub of like what a drug like metformin would be worth extending lifespan by one year, and you just take the 20 year view, so like 2041 today, then it actually would justify running 400 $65 million clinical trials in which 399 of them fail and one succeeds at finding one JARA protector that extends life by one year, like that would be worth it from a money in versus money out scenario with fairly conservative views. Like we, we valued one healthy year here at like way less than what modern gene therapies that are getting reimbursement from insurance companies value one healthy year at, for example. Um, and so, so I, I feel like this is a, a really interesting conclusion from this analysis, but it has one really interesting twist that I wanted to point out to talk about the importance of doing trials like TAME with cheap interventions first. And, and that requires a little bit more context, but that's this slide. So if you take that same sort of 20 year time frame, where you have to get your money back for society in the first 20 years of setting up a bunch of different trials. If you have a drug that costs like metformin, like $70 a year, or yes, like $70, $75 a year for patients, your threshold to like breaking even for the investment that you make to, to distribute and get this drug into the hands of millions and millions of people is very low. Anything above half a year, so that's the 0.49 here. So anything above 0.49 extra qualies that you get, so shifting an average lifespan of 80 to 80.5, if you do better than that, it was worth it as an investment for society. But it's a very price sensitive structure, which people don't usually think about, that because you're treating people for so many years before you see the benefit of this, if you increase the price to $2,000 a year, which is interestingly about what Lipitor cost, so statins at when they were under patent at their highest rate, cost about two grand a year, the bar becomes so much higher for that break-even point. And so with 10 years of clinical trials that start before you start making money back, and then an additional you know, five to 10 years of like, how long people will need to be on the drug before they would have naturally gotten sick and, and eventually died. The, the bar is much higher. You need to be delivering more than a decade of extra healthy life to see an effect in the first 20 years. If you have decade-long clinical trials, this is, I think, model on, on seven, seven to eight-year clinical trials in that short time frame. And that changes dramatically if you either have shorter timeframes in the clinical trials, right? If you can run three to five year clinical trials, then that 13, that 13 years drops way, way down and you can do it uh, with five years or less. Um, and then the figure B on the right here just shows a little bit if you take a longer time frame, more like a 50 year break even. So flipping back, this is more like where in my metformin analysis, this orange bar on the right here, if you take that longer time frame, then it becomes really valuable in the very long term. And so you only need, you know, you can spend two thousand dollars a year on a population that's, you know, almost the entire U.S. for uh, for fifty years, and everybody's paying two thousand a year for that drug, um, and you only need to extend lifespan by about two years to make that worth it from an investment perspective. But the point that I want to bring out at the end of this of like why the generics are actually so important here is that this price element 
actually plays a huge role in how a drug like this would get rolled out, something that I've never seen anybody talk about before. And it's one of the reasons I think so, I think it's so important for the philanthropic trials using generics to come first because they can set a very nice bar for us. And, and then as soon as you lower the clinical trial timelines using those generics, which can exist in a world, um, yeah, which can exist in a world of very long trials and still be worth it. And then as soon as you lower the trial times, then all of the patented drugs can like it changes these models dramatically and we can start running those trials with patented drugs in the 2030s. So this was just an analysis I felt was like a bit wonky, but you know, I wanted to share with this group uh, well, because I, I think it's interesting. Thanks. Uh, if, if I can just chime in for a second, because I would love if you're willing to, if you could share your slides, because I've always been wondering why uh, the effect of altruism movement, for example, isn't more receptive to aging. And I, I know, and I know they're looking into that. Uh, there's a lot of good less wrong calls and so on right now on that topic, but especially because uh, a lot of it in their healthcare economics at least get gets measured in qualities. And if you can actually show uh, a really good effect there, I think it would be really powerful to uh, to potentially uh, ship that over uh, to uh, to their yeah. community. So I'd, I'd be grateful to get my hands on this. Yeah, I, I would be happy to share it with. And then um, we're going to be publishing that as a paper, I think, this year, because uh, we, we wrote it up like two years ago, and then Celine became the CEO of her own company. Uh, I started I started Cameron. We just really haven't had the time or energy to do it, but it's like it's a fairly good group of, Hawk, of Oxford health economists that collaborated with us on the modeling of this. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just an interesting lens about this price sensitivity for a drug protector I've never seen. Before. Yeah, really powerful lens, I think. And, and Andrew Scott, as always said in the chat, also has a, a similar economic framework on that. And he recently presented to the group. I have, one, uh, I don't know if you have one more uh, minute. I have one question from Aaron Meyer here. Sure. Hi, friends. Also, love, very happy that you're talking about effective altruism. I work for the Center for Effective Altruism, so I can definitely confirm that there's a lot of folks who are interested in, in longevity. My question for you, James, was about in VCs, you had kind of made this parallel between VCs and discos. For VCs, it's all about relationship building, finding teams with interesting founders, uh, and then kind of developing that rapport and building trust. How are you doing that with Discos, specifically with Cambrian? So there's still a huge amount of that there, right? Like whenever you're building a company, the team building that company is the big, you know, is the biggest, if not second biggest. Um, factor in the success or failure there. So, so we spend an awful lot of time with our scientific founders before launching any program within Cambrian. Um, but we also have the benefit of having the operators for that company who are making the strategic decisions. Like those are people we're working with every day and have actually, we've worked and built companies with those same people multiple times, like stamping them out, boom, 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 boom. And so by the time that we're launching project, you know, 15 or 20, the team that's doing that has actually worked together to launch three or four other programs before. And that increases that cohesiveness immediately. And that team is gonna like stick together and be part of the same family, whether or not that program is in and of itself successful, which I think builds, you know, back to the celebration of failure, it builds this really positive culture within a, within a group that says, hey, we can be really honest about where the data is and how we're going because we're kind of all in this together. And if this isn't something that's gonna really add to the space, if this isn't the right drug to be in, we can say, we tested this rigorously, this isn't the right thing, and then step back. And that whole team knows that they're going to be diving right back into another program that they love and another interesting hypothesis to test, which I think is, is a really fun way to build a company. All right. Well, I want to be really mindful of your time. I know you've been uh, going on for longer. Yeah. I, wanna... I, know, I know Robert Simon had two questions. Do we want to get one of those and then drop yes, back? I I don't, I'm just thinking. Do you have time? Yes, great. Robert. I, I, ha I have fun with this group. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Robert, are you still here? Yes. Yeah, thank, thanks for taking my uh, question here. So just, just one quick uh, question. Do you have any thoughts on the public perception of what's going on in longevity? There's a major cover on Newsweek this week. Uh, in my view, it's probably the biggest since the Time Magazine, uh, September 2013, uh, discussing Google Calico. So I've got a lot of... Uh, 
pushback and online comments. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in the public relations uh, space uh, angle to all this. I'm, I'm not a PR expert is my uh, caveat here, but I do really like talking about this space and I've started talking with more and more people in the investment community and the broader public community about it. Um, I think that there's a perception that the time is finally here for longevity biotech as an industry. Um, with the table stakes that I talked about, like you're going for another indication first, you're targeting the damage, and then eventually we're going to get there to treat healthy people and have them slow down and not get to slow down their aging process and not get disease. That sequence of things coming together is starting to like pass the bullshit detectors uh, and getting like top marks on almost every serious scientific journalist and and people and like lay people following science as well as you know aficionados and big pharmas and and biotech investors like everyone's kind of lining up behind that um behind that thesis i didn't see this newsweek thing i saw aubrey just posted the link about young blood showing slowing aging which is yeah, not, so my I, I, not my favorite topic uh about i'd encourage you about to, this space, but it's to, a, uh, an important one to take a look at the article and especially the comments on the article just to get a, a pulse on on what the general public is saying about everything going on in the space yeah thanks for your time of course uh uh, the only caveat I would say there is as someone who occasionally makes the mistake of looking at comments on New York Times or Wall Street Journal articles about things other than aging as well, I, I don't view those as a litmus test of the general public, um, but I don't have necessarily a better one to, to show you um, to show you either. I, th I think that, yeah, th there's always going to be pushback on a lot of this stuff. And so I, I don't take the comment stuff too, too, too seriously, but I, yeah, I, sta I stand by, I think that there's a perception that the time is now for this space. Um, very, very last thing I'll say in 30 seconds about the, the conversation that I see, a lot of it has been around the idea of aging as a disease, um, which is something I actually I'm not going to say despise. That's too long, too big of a word. But I think is a distraction. Um, so when we talk about what we need in order to start testing GERA protectors in the clinic, whether or not aging is considered a disease by the general public, like I just don't think it affects us. We can agree, as I do, that aging should be categorized as a disease, and it's helpful to think about it as a disease. But like, there's no regulatory or investment thesis roadblock uh, around this aging as a disease topic. Um, and I find that incredibly uplifting because that means that we don't have the same kind of regulatory risks uh, or let's call it political risks for longevity biotech becoming a thing that would be the case if we needed some, some body somewhere to start regulating aging more as a disease. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to agree. I'm getting much, much, much less pushback also from the more general public on anything related to health extension or longevity. In fact, there's no day that passes without someone on LinkedIn writing me about starting an aging hackathon or something like that and just really wanting to connect around that topic. I, I do think that, you know, in terms of just as a broader sentiment in the last year, last two years, it's been, uh, yeah, I've seen like a major occasion. I haven't been in this space for, for very long at all, but like I do think it's it's significantly more positive than before. So if that's worth anything. Um, anyway, so I wanted to always ask the last question, um, which is how can this group help? What would be helpful on our end? <laughs> um, yeah. To be honest, I think I, I don't have any particular asks for the group. Um, I, I think that convening these things and kind of building a community around this and doing what's already happening here of kind of like having more people share their views and kind of like, uh, you know, I'll be rowing in more or less the same direction is I think the biggest thing that we can do for each other uh, over, the, over the next three or four years. What tends to happen in fields like ours is that there's fracturing around minutia that, that can like 
bring into these big splits and divides in the field. And one of the things that has been immensely gratifying over the last three or four years, especially, is that I've seen almost all of the folks that I know in this space, including many faces that I see here, um, really actually be rooting for each other, even when they have some disagreements around how, you know, this asset is positioned for this or that company is structured or whatever, because there's an alignment around the mission and what we're trying to do and the knowledge that as soon as one group is successful, it kind of raises the uh, raises all ships. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's groups like this that can get us closer and closer, or can kind of like keep us all pointed in that same direction and avoid that fracturing that we, many of us like probably do remember saw uh, we saw happening in the aging space in the aughts, right? Between 2000 and 2010, like there was just fracturing all over the place of all these different theories of aging. Um, and I actually think that the nine hallmarks papers kind of like pulled a lot of those threads that were sh that were shattering back together. And since 2013, there's been much more alignment around like, okay, well, this is like roughly what we need to do. So let's all move in roughly this direction. Well, I think this is so lovely because it echoes what you said earlier about, you know, why uh, the disco model is really nice because uh, people are all pulling on the same string. If one of your approaches fails, then, you know, there's like an, uh, like a plenty full of other ones that uh, go in the same direction and teams working for longer times uh, together, um, you know, that don't get too competitive when one particular aspect doesn't work. The, the broader mission is what counts. Uh, okay, well, thank you, James. I can't thank you enough. Um, from everyone in the group, I think this was really fantastic. Um, I'm hoping that it won't be the last time that you join us. And I would love to get my hands on any slides that you want to share or any follow-ups. I'll be following up with a video to the group. And um, yeah, um, thank you everyone for joining. I will see you all uh, very soon. We have Chris Leptak from the FDA on biomarkers for aging up next uh, end of this month.